purpose, they were completely outnumbered and it sure looked like in that town they would never have an impact. And yet now that false religion is gone and the church of Jesus is still here. And I tell you, sometimes it feels that way. Likewise, today, it sure seems that the church is in trouble. And you know, I've done a lot of research. I have a real heart for young people, and I've done a lot of research. And I tell you, churches are struggling to reach young people, uh, people under 30, some of the hardest people to reach. And tough, tough stuff. It sure seems like the church is in trouble. It seems like the forces of darkness are winning, and the church is in retreat. Yeah. You know, our recent election, and I don't want to get into politics, uh, in Vermont, uh, I've never voted in an election yet in which the per any person I voted for won. Anyway, it's a long story. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to get into politics, you know, uh, but, but our nation has just re-elected and you can believe whatever you want to about economics, about foreign policy, that's not appropriate for us to talk about from the pulpit. Um, but our, the man we've just re-elected, his views on gay marriage and his views on abortion, I mean, clearly he is promoting things that are, that are the exact opposite of what God is promoting. Now you may love his economy and you may love his other stuff, that's between you and him and the Lord and whatever, alright? Uh, but those two things clearly are in violation and yet elected not even by a slim. It was just a pretty... America has decided on those issues. It sure looks like the church is losing and the church is in retreat. But when God's people understand the gospel from both a theologically correct perspective and from a practical, lived-out perspective, no power on earth or hell can stop the church from moving forward. And in my notes it says, that's a good place to say amen, just in case you missed it. <laughs> a little prompt. I have to prompt. I have to prompt Vermonters, okay? <clears throat> when I first, the church that I, this has nothing to do with the sermon, I'll just give a little funny story. The church I've just recently left, the church plant, I was there eight years, is there, and we used it as a church planting center and sent out little splinter churches all over the place. Anyway, and when I first started the church, I couldn't get them to say amen for anything, so I used to have this little like sign I would hold up. It said, say amen. I'd hold it up. And then, anyway, but they finally got the point. I don't have to use that sign anymore. But anyway, that's so, okay. We do whatever we got to do, right? Well, look at verse 19. Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. So Jesus went on to say that he gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven to the church. Now some have misunderstood this verse, and again, there's whole books that have been written on this, there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there about this. Some have understood this verse uh, to think that, mean that heaven could be obtained through church membership or participation in like the rituals or the sacraments of the church because he said, I give the keys of the kingdom, you know, and people misunderstand that. But again, if you look in the context, most, most misunderstandings in the Bible can be cleared up just by looking at the context. Context. In the context of this passage, Jesus could only be referring to two, the two aspects of the gospel that we've just been discussing. The theological truth of the gospel and the practical living out of the gospel. So the keys to the kingdom is understanding the gospel theologically and, and living that gospel out practically. That's the only thing it can be in the context of the scripture. So when the church both preaches sound doctrine and lives out that truth in daily life, then non-believers will also desire to know and experience Jesus. And once those non-believers begin searching for Jesus, it ends with them being loosed from sin. Amen. See, the Holy Spirit begins to do something in their heart. And they begin to search, and they begin to ask questions, and, and there's uncomfortableness. I mean, there's all kinds of awkward conversations sometimes with people. You mean to tell me that my great-grandmother who didn't believe in Jesus is in hell right now? That's an awkward conversation. But we have the conversation, we work through it, and the Holy Spirit begins working in their heart. They begin to understand theologically the correctness of the gospel. They see it in our lives. Maybe not always perfect. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes we get a little wet, you know, in the, in the storm when the water splashes over us, you know. We're not, we're not perfect, but they see it lived out in our life. And they begin to say, whatever that person's got, I've got to have that. I need that. They've got something and I need it. And that search, it may take two years, three years, four years, but it ends. That search ends with them being loosed from sin. But when we fail to both proclaim and live out the gospel, then we leave people bound in the chains of their sin with no hope in this life or hope for eternal life. How sad. You know, when I went to Vermont, again, I don't want to characterize a whole state. I'm talking about my particular experience, the particular town I went to. I live in a larger town now, but when I first went to Vermont, I went to this very small village, uh, to a tiny little church that was about to close. It had been, you know, on a good day, we didn't have this many people on a good day. You know, and it was, a, it was a very struggling situation when I went there. And what I was so struck by was the lack of hope in that community. There was no hope. They were economically depressed. 
uh, most of the marriages and families were just dysfunctional. It was just a sad situation. What was missing was hope. Not only did they not only did they have no hope of heaven, they had no hope of tomorrow. It was just a sad thing. But as the gospel began to penetrate people's hearts and lives, they found hope. Hope for their marriages, hope for their families, hope for a job, hope for education, hope for eternity. That's what we need to give people. Amen. And the more we live out the gospel, the more people get loosed. So let's start living the gospel daily. Well, five things I've tried to say this morning. First, most people do not understand who Jesus really is. I don't think we have to elaborate too much. I think most of us would agree with that. Most people, they just don't get it. They don't understand. All right? They don't. Number two, we must share a theologically correct gospel with them. We've got to first make sure they understand it theologically. We can't give them a, a messed up gospel and say, we'll straighten it out later. All right? Because that's not a gospel. There is only one gospel. Okay? And if we give them the gospel, the theologically correct gospel, then they'll go, wow. And it, it, will they like it? Probably not. Will they agree with it? Probably not. But the Holy Spirit will begin working in their heart. Yes. So we give them a theologically correct gospel. Number three, we live that gospel out in daily life. Yes. We go to those family dinners. We find ourselves in those uncomfortable situations. We pick up the friend who called us and said, I had too many to drink, you know, too many beers to drink. Can you pick me up and take me home? Absolutely. Well, we're going to say, oh no, just go ahead and drive home. Hope it works out for you. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Use our brain here, okay? You know? We, we live out the gospel in daily life. <coughs> Number four, when we do both of those, the hearts, the keys to hearts are opened and people find Jesus. And then number five, no matter how wicked and perverse our culture becomes, churches that hold to these truths will remain. Amen. Now, will churches that don't hold to these truths remain? <laughs> no. And thank God. Because we've got too many out there that aren't holding to the truth. I say close them up and turn them into museums or something. All right, because all they're doing is confusing people. But churches that hold to these truths will remain. And it won't matter how wicked and perverse our culture is. At least right now, we don't have the worship of Pan happening quite yet publicly. It's close, <laughs> all right? And if you turn the right channel on your TV, you can bring it right into your living room. But I'm hoping you either don't have those channels or you skip over them, all right? Uh, but it won't matter how wicked and perverse our culture is. Just keep preaching the correct gospel, keep living the correct gospel, and the true church will remain.